What makes war so horrible is how it cheapens the important things. It takes a precious life that has been brought into this world by loving mothers, nurtured by entire communities, shaped by entire societies, and extinguishes it without a thought or concern. For war cares about no one and waits for nothing. It does not allow us any time to grieve or reflect on loss or to be human. It breaks civility and society. The very things we've engineered and struggled to build to protect us from our worst impulses. War destroys us until we are all alone, fighting for survival with only our most basic instincts guiding us. It turns us into animals and it cheapens life. Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Galactic Empire was a despotic regime that was responsible for massive amounts of death and destruction during its reign, and in many ways before it as well. Their leader, Darth Sidious, was responsible for two massive conflicts, the Clone Wars and the Galactic Civil War, both of which created great instability and injustice in the galaxy. It affected every citizen, every home in one way or another. But the losses that we often talk about center around the heroic Jedi who were gunned down by their own troopers on the eve of the Clone Wars, or the devastating loss of Alderaan, the heart of the Old Republic and the conscience of the galaxy. However, we spend far less time reflecting on those who were not given the opportunity to die heroic deaths. We rarely spare a moment for the Imperials, many of whom were caught in the galactic-wide bureaucratic military system out of necessity and not choice. And even then, those caught up in the fervor and zeal of the Empire were oftentimes misled or brainwashed by the Empire's propaganda machine. While there is no excuse for the many crimes committed by the forces of the Empire, the massive loss of life suffered by the Imperial military should be recognized. Like many of the early wars fought by the Galactic Empire, the Mimbom Campaign was an inherited conflict born out of the Clone Wars. Except in those days, the predecessor to the Imperial military, the Clone Army, fought alongside the Mimbonese against the Separatist aggressors. When the Separatist Council was dissolved in 19 BBY, hostilities ended on the planet, but the Mimbonese celebrations were short and quickly replaced by a new war effort this time against the newly risen empire, which sought to exploit Mimbam for mineral resources to fuel their new growing army. Ironically, these were the same resources that the Separatists had been fighting them for just months earlier. No one knows how many lives were lost in this long, grueling conflict. By 10 BBY, almost a decade later, the battle was still raging. We even witnessed Han Solo engaging the Mibanese Liberation Army around this time. He had recently been pressed into service with the 224th Imperial Armored Division. This was an Imperial Army unit which had inferior equipment and training compared to their elite Stormtrooper counterparts. These type of soldiers were generally used for garrison duty and fighting in larger set-piece battles. The type of trench warfare that was used during the Mimbom campaign was especially costly in manpower. And despite all of the modern advances in battlefield technology like massive walkers, repeating blasters, and turbo laser artillery pieces, these Imperial Army troopers are still climbing assault ladders and sprinting across no man's land. We're not sure how many troopers the Empire expended in this decades-long battle, but I imagine the casualties would number in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. The Liberation of Lothal, as it was called, was a popular uprising that was instigated by the infamous Spectre Cell, led by Jedi Renegades Kanan Jarrus and Ezra Bridger. It was the result of several small skirmishes that overwhelmed the Lothal Sector fleet's ability to control the region and protect its valuable mineral production and refining infrastructure. This would lead to the arrival of Admiral Thrawn's Seventh Fleet. The Chiss commander was cunning and ruthless and an expert at combating guerrilla warfare tactics used by the rebels. While Thrawn was initially successful in inflicting heavy losses on the rebels, including killing Jedi leader Kanan Jarrus, the pressure his forces placed on the various rebel cells operating in the region unified them for one large push against the Imperial garrison on Lothal. 
The Rebels' plan was to infiltrate the massive Imperial Planetary Occupation Facility, or IPOF, and issue Protocol 13, which would require all Imperial forces on the planet to return to the facility for delicious pancakes. The plan worked, and with all Imperial forces on the planet gathered inside the IPOF, the Rebels then launched the massive structure into the upper atmosphere where they detonated several explosives placed near the reactor core. The explosion was seen and celebrated by thousands of Lothal citizens who had just begun to emerge out of the rubble of buildings which were destroyed earlier in the battle when Grand Admiral Thrawn's Seventh Fleet started bombarding the city. Impassioned and angered by the Empire's indiscriminate bombing, they failed to realize that on board that IPOF were tens of thousands of Imperials, including many members of the Academy for Young Imperials. Many more Imperial lives were lost when a fleet of space whales attacked Thrawn's Seventh Fleet and destroyed the entire battle group, which included six Star Destroyers with 30 to 40,000 souls on board each vessel, along with its many support vessels and fighters. The Battle of Scarif is probably one of the most horrific mass casualty incidents in galactic military history, and it's not because of how many individuals were lost, it's because of who caused these casualties. The initial rebel team that infiltrated the planet was no greater than a single platoon of rebel infantry. They immediately started engaging the security forces on the planet in an effort to distract them from the real purpose of their mission, which was to infiltrate the archives and steal the Death Star plans. While it took some time for the Scarif garrison to locate and surround the initial Rogue One attack force, it eventually managed to contain the attackers and destroy them. Even when the Rebel Alliance fleet reinforced the Rogue One team on the ground, they only managed to sneak a squad of X-Wings and one U-Wing to the surface. The heaviest casualties inflicted by the Rebel fleet during the battle occurred when a flight of Y-Wings from Gold Squadron managed to disable the ISD Persecutor with several ion torpedoes. The ship began listing to its side towards the other ISD in the Scarif Defense Fleet known as the Intimidator. The Cyrner class Hammerhead Corvette Lightmaker was taken out of reserve by Admiral Rattus and used to ram the disabled Star Destroyer into the Intimidator. The resulting explosion killed all Imperials on board both ships and then killed several thousands more Imperials stationed on the Scarif Shield Gate. But the largest loss of Imperial life occurs when the DS-1 mobile battle station appeared over the planet. In an effort to stop the Rebels from stealing the Death Star plans, Moff Wilhuff Tarkin orders Base Delta Zero or the destruction of the surface of a planet. All it took was a single reactor ignition aimed at the Citadel base's tower and the entire Imperial facility on the planet along with the entire Scarif garrison which numbered close to 450,000, were soon wiped out. This was completely unnecessary because the plans had actually already made it off-planet. When Luke Skywalker launched those proton torpedoes down the thermal exhaust port, it was a one-in-a-million type of trick shot. It propelled Luke Skywalker to legendary status within the Rebel Alliance, but it made him equally as feared and hated amongst the Imperial military. And that's because on board this 160-kilometer wide starbase was around 2 million souls, including 750,000 passengers. And you see, the Death Star wasn't just a large weapons platform. It was a massive military base that housed all sorts of things from movie theaters to restaurants, R&R facilities, and much, much more. The station was so large it had its own man-made atmosphere and several hospital facilities as well as massive commissaries which could provide every product an Imperial soldier could ever wish for. Those lives were snuffed out in an instant and this moment is widely celebrated and is still seen by many as an immensely positive moment in galactic history. But the lives lost in this single moment probably outweighs any other battle during the Galactic Civil War or the Clone Wars. During the mid-rim retreat, the battle-hardened rebel infantry known as Twilight Company became trapped on the planet of Solast when their CR-90 Corvette transport was shot down. With no way off the planet, the rebel troopers fortified the Insuyu Tor Mineral Processing Facility that was actually built over one of the many volcanoes that dotted the surface of this planet. This single company was already at half strength and had lost its commanding officer pretty recently. It was going up against the 97th Stormtrooper Legion, which was made up of around 10,000 soldiers. Solast was a very important world to the Empire, so its defense was paramount. 
Overhead, an Imperial Star Destroyer had also arrived but was refraining from shooting on the facility because of its value to the Imperial war effort. Led by the recently promoted Captain Hazram Namir, the soldiers of Twilight Company spread out over the volcano in three defensive lines and repelled countless Imperial assaults. Finally, running low on detonators and ammo for heavy weapons, Twilight Company blew up the volcano itself and sent molten lava down onto the advancing Imperial troopers. The 97th Legion would take thousands of casualties and be driven off the planet. Days later, the Battle of Solus would fully kick in and it would fall into rebel hands. The Battle of Endor was supposed to be a trap that would finally dismantle the rebel fleet and destroy their ability to carry out a conventional military conflict against the Galactic Empire. The Emperor had gathered a massive fleet that featured over 30 Star Destroyers and also included battle cruisers and Star Dreadnoughts. But at the center of it all was the massive DS2 mobile battle station. This was the Empire's answer to the Rebels' victory at Yavin 4, a much larger and much more powerful Death Star over 200 kilometers in length and equipped with a few hundred thousand weapons and placements. And of course, the planet-shattering Kyber Crystal-powered Super Laser. Even though the battle station was still incomplete, it had a crew of around 1.2 million beings on board, along with 600,000 security personnel and the ability to house a total of 2.4 million passengers on board. This included flight crews, specialists, scientists, family members of the crew, and of course, civilian advisors and field trips from like youth academies. All hands were lost on the second Death Star when Rebel pilots set off its reactor core with a proton torpedo. No more Taco Tuesdays in the Imperial Mess Hall. The lives lost in the second Death Star's destruction equates to almost all of the lives lost during the Mid-Rim Offensive carried out by the Rebels. But these weren't the only losses the Empire suffered during the Battle of Endor. The entire 501st Legion, which was stationed on the forest moon of Endor, was destroyed. It's over 10,000 stormtroopers killed, wounded, captured, and of course eaten. In space, the 19-kilometer-long Executor-class Star Dreadnought lost control when an A-Wing smashed through its command bridge. This caused the Super Star Destroyer to crash into the nearby second Death Star. The ship had over 280,000 crew members along with another 38,000 passengers. That includes security forces and support staff. All hands were lost aboard the ship during this collision. More than half of the Imperial fleet, around 15 Imperial-class Star Destroyers, were destroyed with around 37,000 crew and 10,000 security forces on board each one of them. This brings the casualty numbers to well over 1 million troops. This does not include the loss of countless smaller cruisers, frigates, support ships, and fighters as well. The Battle of Endor marked not only the death of the Emperor, but also the beginning of the end for the Empire. In the next year, until the Battle of Jakku, Palpatine's devastating contingency plan would create chaos amongst Imperial forces, and the Rebel Alliance would form into the New Republic and field a conventional military for the first time that would consistently grow in size. Operation Cinder was a key part to Emperor Palpatine's contingency plan. It was basically a scorched earth policy designed to punish both the Empire for its failures and the New Republic for its success. Among the most horrific moments of Operation Cinder was the destruction of the Imperial world of Vardos. Widely hailed as an Imperial utopia, the citizens of Vardos truly believed in the Empire and most likely would have continued fighting against the New Republic of Astu. The surface of the planet was covered in Imperial military installations and bases along with several youth academies. The planet's population is unknown, but thought to be in the millions. Admiral Garrick Versio was ordered by one of Palpatine's Sentinels to use the Climate Disruption Array satellites to generate massive storms on the planet. This basically created massive hurricanes and tornadoes over the entire planet. What made the situation even more messed up was that Imperial forces would man AA batteries and occupy space stations to the bitter end, shooting down anyone desperate enough to make an escape off the planet in their own civilian vessels. An unknown number of Imperial citizens and soldiers died in this crazy event, but the casualties most likely were in the millions. There's nothing random with Mix Mayfield's murder of Valen Hess. Sure, it jeopardized Din Djarin's mission to find the location of Baby Gokert, but Mayfield had a history with the Imperial Army General. You see, the General had been in command of Mayfield's unit during Operation Cinder. 
Valon has sent an entire division of Imperial Army troopers, that's around 10,000 soldiers, to take the city. When the local resistance refused to move out of the way of the Imperial onslaught, Valon has ordered the destruction of the entire city, most likely via orbital bombardment. The majority of Miggs Mayfield's Imperial Army Division was wiped out along with most of the city. The Battle of Jakku was actually one of the largest battles of the entire Galactic Civil War. This is one of the few battles in which the New Republic and Galactic Empire were evenly matched. By this point, the New Republic was no longer a ragtag fleet of guerrilla fighters. They developed their own capital ship, the Starhawk-class battleship Mark I. This ship was specifically designed to take on an Imperial-class Star Destroyer. The Empire had three entire battle groups on the planet, led by an Executive-class Star Dreadnought and dozens of Imperial-class Star Destroyers. This represented the largest Imperial Remnant forces still left in the galaxy, which was no small laughing matter. If you take a closer look at the numbers, the New Republic are still outnumbered during this battle, both in space and also in the number of ground troops they're able to deploy. But the Empire was in disarray. Their command chain had been severed along with their logistical support. Discipline was poor and morale was at an all-time low. Palpatine's contingency had also planned on turning Jakku into a graveyard for both the New Republic and the Imperial military. It was supposed to be the battle that ended all battles. Gallius Rax, the protege to Palpatine, wanted to wait for both fleets to engage before detonating several Sith artifacts in the core of the planet, which he hoped would take out everyone. This was an extremely chaotic battle. Massive amounts of life were lost. The fighting was savage and irrational. On several occasions, Imperial Navy ships would just ram straight into New Republic ships, killing everyone on board. One Starhawk-class battleship even uses its tractor beam to pull down the Imperial command ship Ravager, which took out entire squadrons of AT-ATs on the ground and killed thousands of ground infantry. The Battle of Jakku was Palpatine's last great masterpiece during the Galactic Empire period. It was a completely pointless war. The Galactic Empire basically ceased to exist as an entity, and the New Republic's victory was already a foregone conclusion. Millions of New Republic and Imperial soldiers, pilots, and crew would die littering the planets with the husk of their vehicles, ships, and helmets. Entire regions of the planet would be scorched from the fire of downed ships. One area would be designated by future scavengers as the Graveyard of Giants. So there you have it, guys. Those are 10 of the largest mass casualty events in the Galactic Empire's history. They definitely took a beating from both the Rebels and the New Republic. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.